So uh, last night we were thinking um, about why to think about heaven and just an introduction to, uh, to it. Um, in this next section of Revelation, John uh, turns into, well, there is an angel, and, and this angel turns into a tour guide and he, he escorts John around his heavenly home. Uh, it's quite striking. He even brings a tape measure with him in verse 15 uh, to, to do the measurements. And we're told about the construction materials of this heavenly home. And it's, uh, it's not just bricks and concrete and wood, as we're going to see. Uh, and so this, this passage is really a, a tour um, of our heavenly home. So think of a property program on telly. That There's quite a few of them, aren't there? Um, grand Designs and um, Escape to the Country. That There used to be something called um, MTV Cribs where celebrities would let the cameras into their, their mansions and kind of just show off um, how kind of impressive they were. Um, and it's a little bit like that. Here, here is top property, hot heavenly real estate. And God is letting in the cameras to, to show us around, to, to show off um, what is there. We're supposed to, to, to drool over this. It, it, it would make great TV, I think. Um, and um, Revelation 21 is meant to leave us thinking, I, I want that. Um, but unlike MTV Cribs, uh, it's okay to want it. Uh, there's no sense in which looking at this is stirring up covetousness or greed. There's nothing um, sinful about desiring this place. Uh, watching this TV show won't make you covetous or stingy. In fact, it will make you more generous. Um, it will, um, as you fall in love with this property, it will make you more willing to lose your possessions. Um, there are four things um, I want us to see uh, about this property. Um, so the location, the security, the size, and the value. Firstly, at your home's location... I don't know if there are any estate agents here, but I think the, fir the first rule of property is um, location, 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 that they say, isn't it? And so um, a, a four-bedroom property in one place, uh, it doesn't, won't necessarily be as valuable as a four-property location in another place. Um, it, it, it's where this home is makes all the difference, doesn't it? And so what is the location of this heavenly home? Answer, verse 10, it's in a city. It's in a city. Look at verse 9 and 10. An angel comes to John and says, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. In verse 10, he carried me away in the spirit uh, to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And, and there's a surprise there as he's speaking, if you're thinking. So uh, John's expecting to see a bride, but, but instead he's shown a city. Uh, we're meant to kind of do a double take, verse 10. It turns out the bride is a building, and the wife is a metropolis. And maybe you, you read that, and immediately it's a bit of a write-off. Um, a city? No thanks. Um, you imagine the smog and the smoke and the traffic. Uh, you were hoping that heaven was a kind of very big house in the country. And um, city, city life, um, it, it requires you to live in close proximity uh, to, to others, doesn't it? Um, so, uh, many Londoners um, want to escape to the country, I, I find. Um, um, and the mindset in London is, I'm in London for a while, and I, I plan to kind of move on. Um, people often think that God is somehow closer to, to, to the green spaces um, than to townhouses. But you see, the Bible, it begins in a garden, and it ends in a, a city. Uh, and, and God is not promising to whisk us away in the future to a lonely tropical island paradise. He's taking you to a city, the holy city, Jerusalem. But, but I want to say that that is not a disappointment. Do, do not um, sort of transfer the, the, the litter and the transport problems of, of our cities um, there. To just think what this redeemed city will be like. Uh, will be like. Uh, Jonathan Edwards preached um, a, a famous sermon um, called Heaven is a World of Love. And he, he, he meditates on, on what it will be like, what the, the society of heaven will be like. Um, and, and he thinks what it will mean for us to love each other perfectly. And it's, it's just a, an absolutely wonderful sermon. Uh, he says that there will be no envy as we look at others 
being more prominent than us. But, but not just no envy, we'll actually take joy in, in seeing others advanced ahead. As we see them advance, we will feel happier. Uh, the, the happier my neighbor is, the, the, the happier I will be. And what's more, the, the higher my neighbor is, the humbler my neighbor will be. The, the higher my neighbor is in heaven, the more he will love everybody else. He kind of carries on at John Hammers. He says, um, there in heaven, love will always be mutual. So it will never be one way. You'll never have that experience of kind of loving someone and just feeling like you're hitting the wall. And we will be loved back in, in sort of proportionate ways, appropriately, um, in a fitting way. Some, he says, um, you know, some will be more loved than others in heaven, uh, but those people will um, love back more than others too. <laughs> so he th thinks about the Apostle John, right? The Apostle John is who's, who's here. He's called the beloved disciple. In this special way, Jesus had a particular affection for John. Um, and, and so he, he, John Edwards argues, John will be more loved than other disciples, but John will also love us more than we love him. He has this capacity to, to, to love back. And as you start to think it through, what will this city life, this, this society be like? Um, everyone you pass loves you and, and you love them. Strangers become a, a source of, of constant delight. So imagine driving when other drivers um, are not obstacles to, to be overcome, um, but delightful neighbours. Every lane change make, makes you happy <laughs> rather than um, angrier. Uh, some of us, we, we get people out, don't we? It's not unusual to, to, to kind of need some space. I don't know if, it, if it's true in Scotland, but the Englishman's home is his castle, they, they say. And, and we often want to pull up the drawbridge for, for, from relationships. But, but even the most grouchy of us uh, will know that, that the pleasure that we, we take in, in, in some company, won't we? Um, and just um, the idea is to take that and, and ramp it up. Someone asked, uh, will we recognize our friends in heaven? The answer back was, uh, you'll only in heaven really know your friends. Uh, you, you'll discover them in, in ways you'd never imagined before. And so the idea is forget property in Monte Carlo or in Mayfair. Uh, the New Jerusalem is, is the place of human socializing as it's meant to be. Uh, but, but notice um, something else about this city. Um, um, it is also the temple. It's as if in this picture that the temple and the city have been collapsed together. Verse 22, which we'll look at um, this afternoon, says there is no more temple. Um, and if you know your Bible, that, that's a kind of awful thought um, initially. Uh, it sounds like a catastrophe, but it's not that the temple is missing. It's that the temple and the city now, now coincide, that they are coextensive with each other. Uh, there isn't a spot of this city that isn't temple. Uh, and you can see this in a number of ways uh, as it's described. So, so firstly, in verse 16, the, the, the city is a cube, we're told. Its length and its width and its height are equal. I think, if I'm not mathematical, but that means it's got to be a cube, right? Um, and the only other cube-shaped place in the Bible is, is the Holy of Holies um, in the tabernacle and the temple. Uh, secondly, the, the jewels listed in verse 19 to 20, that they are a deliberate echoes of the, the high priest's breastplate and that the jewels that were there. So it's no longer just the, the, the high priest who has access to God, but, but the whole city does. And then thirdly, the designs for this city are inspired by a vision of the temple that Ezekiel has in, in the end of his prophecy. If you, if you read the book of Ezekiel, the prophecy finishes with, this, with eight huge chapters describing this temple being constructed. Um, and th this city is clearly following the blueprints of what Ezekiel saw. So, so our heavenly home is not just a, a place of human socializing and a company. Um, God himself uh, lives there. Uh, we're, we're moving in with God. God is present in that place in a more intense and glorious and soul-satisfying way than it is possible 
to conceive. Um, in that home, there'll be no more travel necessary, no more pilgrimage, no more coming and going, just an eternal arriving and entering deeper and deeper into the life of God. Psalm 84 um, has the psalmist where he's um, jealous of sparrows and of swallows. I don't know if you remember why. He's jealous of them because he says, there's a sparrow finds a home at your altars. The swallow makes a nest for herself where she can leave her young at your altars. He's jealous of the birds because they can be with God 24-7 and in God's temple. And, and as God takes us on this tour of our heavenly home, he's telling us it is um, his place, his home, as well as ours. Uh, the, the, city, um, the city location, um, notice, is, is central. It, it is at the center of the world, at the center of things. So the city's four gates um, are in every direction. Pilgrims travel to it from north, south, east, and west. And I don't know how you draw maps in your mind. I always find it fascinating that um, the Brits have put themselves right in the center of the world map, haven't we? Like we're, we're at the center of things. And, 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 and God wants this city to, to be the center that's centralized in your mental map of the world, in your geography, everything um, heads and converges there. So that, that's your city's, that, that's your home's location, a city, a God's city. Secondly, your home security. Uh, what's your home security like? Have you got a burger alarm or one of those like security chain things you put on at night? Um, have you got a security camera? Did you double lock the door? Um, as John is, is given a tour, his tour focuses on, on three things in verse 12 to 14. Uh, the city walls, the city gates, and the city's foundations. So look at the wall, verse 12. This city, it had a great high wall. Verse 17 tells us the height of this wall is, is just over 65 meters. Um, so that, that is as high as a 21-story building, if you're just trying to depict it. So uh, forget the Berlin Wall, forget Hadrian's Wall, um, or the Great Wall of China. This, this wall is, is bigger, and it is, it is massive as it's being depicted. Uh, we build walls for protection, don't we? That, that's what they're doing. So, so think how safe these walls make you feel. No, no burglar is going to uh, break in and steal. No armies are going to scale these walls. The, the imagery is this place is safe. It is more secure than Fort Knox or some deep um, underground bunker. Uh, when 9-11 um, unfolded, uh, George W. Bush was in Florida at, at a school, lots of people know that, and he was bundled onto Air Force One, and they say that Air Force One took off so fast, at such a steep angle, that kind of people floated momentarily, okay? Um, and um, initially, when they were in the air, there was all kinds of confusing messages going on. They thought that there was, like, threats to, to the president's life, and uh, that everyone was, was nervous on the plane. Um, and then um, one of the, the, the sort of staffers describe um, seeing... Uh, F-16 jets um, c come to the side of, of Air Force One uh, and the feeling of just sudden safety and security. Um, and, and that is the idea, isn't it? That, that this, this place that we are going is, is impregnable. It is inviolable, absolutely secure. But then there are the gates, verse 12 to 13. Twelve of them, they face in all four directions, north, south, east, and west. Gates are the most vulnerable points of a city, uh, where people are let in and, and let out. But, but these 12 gates, they are guarded by 12 angels, we're told. Verse 12. Um, and they have, so it's kind of like angelic bouncers, um, overseeing, pr protecting. Um, and these gates have inscriptions of the 12 tribes on them. Um, it's not unusual um, for, for entrance ways to, to kind of have um, things depicted on them. Entrances are, are significant places. Uh, in terms of metaphor, so in Deuteronomy, God tells Israel to, to write the Torah on their entrance ways. Um, it, it's this sort of place of going in and out. Um, in the UK, we, we decorate our front doors. Don't we? we have a doormat or maybe a doorbell, a knocker, lights. Um, the idea is that this, this picture is, is of um, the, the perfect place of safety and of welcome, I think. 
This home has the perfect mix of, of openness and closeness. But verse 25 will actually tell us that these gates will never be shut. Uh, it won't be necessary. This, this city is not just inward looking. It's not just stuffy and defensive and in lockdown. It hasn't just raised the barricades. It can be accessed from all directions. It is open and safe and secure. And then look at its foundations, verse 14. Um, that the wall of the city had not one foundation, not two foundations, but 12 foundations. And on them were the names of the tw- 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. When you buy a house, insurance companies uh, want to know, um, has, is there any history of subsidence in, in the property? Um, if the ground is slipping, then your home is at risk. You, you may not get insurance. But, but not this home um, in this city. The idea is let, let the floods come, let the rains come. Uh, nothing will threaten these foundations. The city is built on the 12 apostles of the Lamb, that the New Testament scriptures um, and all its revelation are the rock bottom. So um, what does this home security mean for us here and now, where where thieves do break in and steal? I I think the idea is that the protection of this city, it it reaches out to us in this present age. But before we've even reached there, its protection reaches to us. But but by faith, we we are already experiencing the security of these foundations. See, our our earthly homes, they are threatened, aren't they? Um, Home often feels insecure and fragile. I don't know your your situation, maybe some of you are only kind of a month away from being evicted by your landlord. Um, I don't know how how deep your roots feel in, in Dundee. Um, and I, just out, out there in the, the, the kind of world, there's a lot of um, um, anger in the public square, isn't there? A lot of volatility. And I think it comes from insecurity, fr- from rootlessness, a sense of, of this world is so changeable and, and, and unreliable. Um, but we don't need to be volatile ourselves as, as God's people, but belonging to this city. When our beliefs are challenged, we don't need to get defensive We don't need to get touchy. Every challenge to us as Christians isn't actually a a threat to our identity and security. We have this heavenly city. And so we're free to be calm and silent in the face of opposition. See, this home, it's not for us, if you're a Christian, this isn't an advert of something that you may get. It, It is a possession, isn't it? Already ours. And its security is what in the present can guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So that's the home's um, security. Thirdly, your home's size. In verse 15 to 17, the angel starts measuring. He gets out this large tape measure of gold. Um, And this isn't the first time um, something is measured in the book of Revelation. There's quite a lot of measuring that happens. Uh, And in in Revelation 11, John is told to take measurements of the temple. Um, In Ezekiel, an angel is measuring the dimensions of the the temple vision there. In Zechariah 2, an angel is doing some measuring. Um, It's normal, isn't it, for for, for builders to take measurements, uh, to to check things. Prospective owners want to know what the square footage of the the property um, is going to be. Um, I was looking at the biggest residence in in London is a a um, 25-bedroom mansion. Um, amazing. And um, w- w- when you measure, um, it, I guess it's also showing a, an attention to detail, a concern for accuracy. And so when the Bible bothers to, to record the measurements of, of a place, it's clearly telling you that this, pay attention, that this building matters. Well, well what do these measurements tell us? I'm sure there's more than this, but, but at the very least, it's telling you and I that, that heaven is very very, very big. I think we, we miss the size like because of the, the units of measurement. We don't quite kind of track them, but just, just notice. So verse 16 uses the measurement of a stadia, and a, a, we're told that the, the city um, is 12,000 stadia long, 12,000 stadia wide, and 12,000 stadia high. Okay, and these are gargantuan measurements. So um, 
one stadium is about 200 meters. And so if you do the math, 12,000 stadia is about 1,500 miles. So, so the New Jerusalem, we're told, just in terms of the, 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 the pictures, 1,000 miles long, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles high. Um, so just sort of perspective, that, that's double the length of Britain. Um, the International Space Station orbits the Earth at just 240 miles. So 1,500. It's, <laughs> um, uh, it's a reminder, isn't it? This, this, this imagery, it's not literal architecture. Um, the walls are just 216 feet high. So we're not supposed to reconstruct this. But, but here's the point, isn't it? That heaven is an expanse so high, so wide, and so deep that we cannot comprehend its spaciousness. This isn't a cramped city uh, where, where there's a kind of tight squeeze with six people in a bedroom. Uh, this is a city that can accommodate that great multitude that no one can number that is talked about in chapter 7 from every tribe and tongue and kindred and nation. Uh, you won't be able to carry out a census in heaven, will you? Uh, there won't be an office for national statistics. There are just too many doors to knock. When the Bible calls Jesus the saviour of the world, it, it means it. He's the saviour of a very, very big group of people that is so large we can justifiably call it the world. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus refers to his little flock, um, and, and we can often feel little, can't we? Uh, it's, it's a common thing to feel. We can feel few in number. But, but as we think about our heavenly homeland, we, we are reminded that the church of the Lord Jesus is much, much bigger than we think. Fourthly, our home's value. Uh, verse 18 to 21 tell us what the construction materials of this city are. Homeowners often want marble countertops in their kitchen and chrome fixings in their bathroom, hardwood furniture, and it all costs, doesn't it? Um, good building materials do not come cheap. But the new Jerusalem is not made uh, with kind of just bags of sand and, and concrete that will crumble. It's not just cheap um, material from B&Q. Uh, verse 18 says, the walls are built of jasper. Uh, so, so not brick or flint, but, but all of the whole wall is made of precious stone. Um, we got two um, little garden walls built in our garden um, over the summer, and I was struck by how much um, work it was and um, uh, how much, was need how much it, it just cost for the bricks. So, so think how much Jasper is needed to build walls of that size. It's um, impossibly large quantities. The city, verse 21 says, it was of pure gold, clear as glass. The streets of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. The Bank of England vault contains 400,000 gold bars, worth over 200 billion pounds. Um, and they say that's enough gold to cover the whole of the UK in gold leaf um, six times. But, but the, the quantities here, this is not just gold leaf, this is solid gold. And so again, we're not to think of the dirty streets of Dundee um, with, with crisp packets and dog muck um, and syringes. The, the, the city's foundations are jewel encrusted, verse 19 to 20. And so this home is beautiful. These precious stones and jewels sparkle with beauty, that they impress their light and colour, mixed with their hard texture, speak of, of enduring, the enduring quality of this city. It's not going to fade away. The, the, these jewels are making statements of the unimaginable power of what is being constructed. They show wealth and power and status, don't they? And the quantity is just mind-boggling. And so... Um, as the estate agent shows us round, you don't want to ask the asking price, do you? It's just un implausibly, impossibly high. And so this is your, your heavenly home. Uh, we're going to see more um, this afternoon. But, but this is the property that God is showcasing. He is saying, look. He's asking for your attention he wants this property to feature in your thinking. We love things according to their value, don't we? So you, you, you love something cheap, 
appropriately weakly and love something valuable appropriately strong. And, and so the kind of love this is calling for, love of God and, and love of heaven, is that this is the overriding value. But um, there's another property on the market. There's another property, um, another city that is asking you to buy in. If you read the book of Revelation, the new Jerusalem isn't the only property on display. And the new Jerusalem contrasts the ungodly Babylon. If, if you kind of flip back to chapters 17 and 18 in, in Revelation, uh, you see this other property. And, and there are all kinds of parallels between these two places, these two cities. Uh, Babylon has bling. It's got wealth and affluence, but Babylon is attractive. Her streets are filled with all kinds of merchandise. There's this amazing catalogue of, of, um, of her, her merchandise in chapter 18, verse 11, uh, 12 and 13. It says, it talks about her cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots. Okay, that's 27 items. And it, the idea is it's kind of like shopping at this high-end shopping centre, um, it, the idea is that, that in Babylon we can kit out our home with, with all this impressive luxury. That the streets and the markets of Babylon are exciting and exotic. That the nightlife and entertainment in Babylon is lively. It's all kind of music. Babylon is this place of pleasure. And so there is this decision to be made. <laughs> Estate agents are showing you round um, these the, the sort of alternative property portfolios. Uh, there are kind of historic and um, city rivalries, aren't there? So um, London, Paris, Cambridge, Oxford, Manchester, Liverpool, um, Edinburgh, Glasgow. I don't know if there's a Dundee one, I'm not, I'm not sure. But um, uh, uh, here is this much deeper, more powerful rivalry. The book of Revelation is presenting you with, with this ultimate rivalry between Babylon and Jerusalem. Which will you go for? Which streets do you want to walk? The streets of Babylon or the streets of the New Jerusalem? Isn't it interesting? Both cities are depicted as brides. John sees Babylon as this kind of Babylonian prostitute and Jerusalem as this Jerusalemite bride. They're both dressed similarly, both wear gold, precious stones and pearls. They are both decked out in the finest jewelry. Which woman will you go for? Which woman will capture your heart? And we need to be clear, don't we? Right now, one is much more visible than the other. And this morning, it is the city of Babylon that is big and bright and shiny. And right now, Jerusalem does not look like much. This city founded on the 12 apostles of the Lamb that doesn't look like much, does it? And here we are in this, um, this center. And, um, uh, but we're not, in terms of the world's changing scale, that doesn't look impressive. Not much to see here. The Christian church doesn't look like she's got a future. And for some of you, Babylon is so bright that you can't even see Jerusalem when you get back home, you'll go back to the, the caresses of Babylon. That This week, you will be in her soft embrace and her shiny, sensuous caresses. That's where you belong. And God is saying to, to you uh, this morning, to us, uh, you're making a massive mistake. You are misjudging these two cities completely because the city of Babylon is doomed. Chapter 18 and 19 record it. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. That's the cry of Revelation chapter 18. You're laying up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves will break in and steal. And Jesus is saying, the, the gospel is calling you to lay up treasure in heaven, which will last forever. Some of you maybe are on right move and you have your email 
alert set to kind of new property coming um, available. Uh, but, but God is giving us this heavenly tour, not to get us into arguments about the heavenly wallpaper, but to, to detach us from Babylon, to unhook us from its pull. God wants us to be able to look at Babylon in the face and say, no, and head to Jerusalem. There's a lovely line, um, Hebrews 10, verse 34. It talks about um, the plundering of your property. So, um, maybe quite a few of you are property owners. In, in Ilford, everyone wants to be on the property ladder, but very few are. Um, but uh, just imagine what it was like for your property to be plundered, for, for, the, for the government to come along and just take your property, steal it, because you're a Christian. Imagine losing your house. <laughs> government confiscates it. Hebrews 10.34 says, you accepted the plundering of your property. Could you, could you accept that? But, but then it doesn't just say that. It says you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. And, and you think, what, like what, what planet are they on? Well, the verse carries on, explains, doesn't it? Um, you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. That is the explanation. Christians could joyfully lose stuff here because they were so convinced of property there. And, and this is how Revelation 21 is meant to work. That this vision of the city of Zion unhooks me from the city of Babylon. That eternal city frees me from addiction to the temporal city so that I can hold it lighter and let go. It was said of the Puritan Richard Sibbs that heaven was in him before he was in heaven. And in one sense, that is the gospel. That is what Jesus has come to do. He's come to put heaven in us before we get to heaven. God, God comes, doesn't he, to, to make his home inside us so, so that we're ready for that heavenly home. He plants this love for Zion inside you so that that is where you want to be. And God will do that in the gospel. Um, in Jesus, his son, God will put heaven inside you to prepare you for being inside heaven. Let's pray.